summary of um, sort of something that I want you to keep in mind. Um, now, um, you may remember I started by reviewing sort of a particular way of summarizing conventional condensed matter physics, at least the way we understand it in a productive way, as a, as a building up to complicated phenomena by starting either in the zero temperature limit or in a low frequency limit. Um, and the trouble is that that's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because one can do calculations, but it's a curse um, because looking for new phenomena um, is complicated because you have so many different things to try. And in fact, one of the reasons I, as a, as a personal note, one of the reasons I uh, was, in some sense, uh, uh, motivated to think uh, away from the zero temperature limit instances because there were several experiments of the kind that uh, Air has shown where people had um, uh, interesting data and of this of the transport kind or any other kind where they would sort of um, say well we have to find a quantum critical point there because that's one way that we can explain it um, and so the question is and, you know you think about what, why is that the case and the answer is that we don't have enough exactly worked out of interesting behaviors without doing so. So, um, let me just write a sentence and explain what. Um, avoid nicely organized by the zero temperature limit, for example, um, structure, theoretical structure, um, by working. Finite temperature, in fact, or one, and spell out and um, uh, focusing on intrinsically. Dynamical problems and taking that. And so the hope is or was hope. Find and solve quotation marks all over um, interesting case studies in sharply different in And solve these studies in precisely defined, precisely defined simple, simple models. Be specific. You know, what I this is still a reminder of how. Right. So take isolated systems that there is no extrinsic source of temperature. We will want to ask, and this is what I'm going to switch to next, is that what does it mean to have a temperature when you have an ice state form? Is there a natural So, uh, right, let me explain. This is important because ultimately it's nice to have these uh, 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 lofty ambitions. At the end of the day, you want to be able to solve something. Right? So, um, uh, Precisely defined simple models. By simple models, so in order to be able to solve something, these models should not have too many scales. They should be, in some sense, simplified to the point where any any scale you discover by accident or by fortune will be interesting by definition because you did not put it in. It's like you know, 
in, in, uh, in, in anybody physics, if I want it to be extremely reductive, I could say that there are two types of interesting phenomena. Power laws, scale invariance, critical points, or generation of scale. You know, when you do PCS theory and you discover that something is 10 to the 10, 10 negative 10 of uh, microscopic parameters, okay, how did that happen? Right? It's not something you can just put in by hand. Right? So most first order phase transitions tend to be boring by that classification because you can do back to the envelope theory and say, okay, left envelope sphere, um, okay, that's too high of a temperature, long scale. Let's look at the phonons, too high temperature, okay, we can estimate it from the high frequency that you uh, that's usually on at 50 Kelvin. Okay, that's within a, a negotiation distance of where it's happening. Maybe it's a structural transition. So the idea somehow is that in these in the kinds of models that, for example, I'd recommend pulling up that line for you too. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that <laughs> the I'm spoiled. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm mistaken. It's not so bad. Yeah, yeah. My poor attempt at performance. Um, performative art. Um, let's see. Um, so, um, right. I actually, let, let me. Uh, I'll answer your question in, in the order that I uh, uh, that I initially had in mind. So, tools lost. Right. If, if you adopt this kind of a, 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 a idealistic view of what you're trying to do. You lose certain tools. You lose tools of Juan Monte Carlo. You lose your uh, serious uh, uh, analytic theorists. You uh, lose imaginary time field functions. They're not useful. You want to do study purely dynamical questions. Unless you can do. Uh, well, so there are ways of doing analytic continuations. Um, uh, they don't tend to be useful for. Uh, problems of finite temperatures, unless you can do everything analytically. So the tools that are out, out are also sort of established techniques, sort of Lindblad type operators for uh, uh, open systems. And so if you realize that, uh, you know, there aren't any tools. There just aren't any tools. And I think. Um, Right, so ED stands for exact diagonalization, and this typically means the number of particles that go through less than one. Right, so there's a, uh, um, what else did I write down? Short times, short time expansions. And again, to put it in the context, in the context, you know, you're basically regressing, if you try to follow this kind of a, a program, you're regressing yourself to study mean body physics before ensemble. Ensemble, where there were high temperature series, with no numerics, and you're just going to make do with what's available and try to um, not try to put critical exponents because you're not even sure if the critical exponents are universal. Right? Or, or if anything is a mean field theory. So short time expansion, for example, has the closest Analogy to high temperature series. Um, so things are not so dire. In fact, uh, uh, hopefully by Friday we'll have a nice set of lectures by Sid from Eshran on real space RG methods that become useful when you have strongly disordered models. Um, now, of course, broadly entanglement as a tool. Nuisance, uh, 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 certainly a tool for getting jobs. Uh, so there the, are the techniques involved in all the matrix product states that are being developed for studying specifically these kinds of problems. They're not as prevalent as Ron's. I don't, I don't think Steve Wright can talk about that particular application. So, yeah. Because one month call is anything imaginary time is equilibrium. And the, the whole question here becomes well, okay, so I, I don't know how to use one month call to compute transitivity or any kind of time dependent response. So this is that the Yes, I think uh, the question is to say that there is a, a, a body of knowledge 
which is developed, which is all developed together, rather than trying to figure out a way to graph new knowledge on top of that, you said that I'm interested in problems that are a finite distance out of. Right. So, what I argued in the first lecture was that um, when you actually look at the way you think about uh, uh, techniques, they're all organized from ground state up. So, the reason, and, and when you're at finite temperatures and you're looking at dynamical problems, you don't want to treat interactions among hard particles. But, but it studies equilibrium. There are ways of extracting real-time dynamics. So, so, so right, there are two organizational schemes that I could think of. One of them is studying from zero temperature up. The other one is using my plot by Monte Carlo techniques, which you correct at zero frequency at these temperatures, if they work, and then push into finite frequency. Right, so, I think the, uh, the point is that there's again, as far as I know, there's no way to. And that's actually real physics. You know, there's no way to take Monte Carlo data and compute linear response dynamics. You're actually missing information about, uh, you know, about uh, the dynamical processes in Monte Carlo theory. And I think quantum Monte Carlo actually carries that. How uh, the uh, the time it takes. Well, Monte Carlo time is not real. Ultimately, you are computing uh, an evolution operator, but how do actually? Well, we can discuss it better. I mean, I'd like to remove this from the list, <laughs> but it's just uh, as a data point, there's not a single study of localization, Anderson localization problems using quantum Monte Carlo, even non term It's not. The, it doesn't seem to be the right thing. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to change my opinions if there's uh, uh, specific things. Okay. All right. So that's uh, again not to belabor the review aspect of it. So let's from I'm going to have to skip some aspects of history and maybe just say them about right write without writing. So what is thermalization? Um, so classical. Classical history or prehistory. <clears throat> um, the idea is that we have particles, and these particles obey Newton's laws. Um, I have in mind the main body system, whatever there is wiggles, that means a set of things, and this is an equation of order to couple those into different equations. And the idea is there are out of this we get. Nice probability distributions with enough sampling of real time trajectories so that and, and so the physics. Physical mechanism. There are two ways of talking about it. One of them is the one that we find in undergraduate detail, which is fluctuations, fluctuations of energy particles, etc., among subsystems. But then you can ask, well, okay, who says that things should fluctuate? You know, the doors are logical, will not fluctuate out of the room at all. Right? And so um, the uh, um, so that's that's the I would con consider this to be a baby version of the answer, in fact, of not, not an answer. Uh, the other one that goes back to Poincaré and other people that are in favor that I haven't read. Um, is that um, there is a notion of ergodicity of Newtonian classical <coughs> dynamics, whereby um, the way statistical picture is generated is that the re real time dynamics on fairly short time scales actually goes and generates this distribution to the bytes, just exploring the, the whole main body sort of 
So my understanding is that this has been proven in very well chosen models, essentially sort of connected to classical genetics by Joel Winovitz and some co-workers in the 60s. But generally, this is in, in realistic models, this is believed to be true based on sort of less rigorous analysis. We use it because it works. And so the question is, um, so the question that was that stood there from the beginning in quantum mechanics is, you know, what is quantum, what is that mech, ergodicity, you know, why would it be true? And there are obvious problems. You know, I think the question is, that is there a natural way to gener generalize? And natural, there, there are certainly clearly natural obstru obstructions. But one natural obstruction is that the Schrodinger equation is linear. Linear equation, no chaos, no entropy generation, generation, i.e., pure states to pure states. There's no natural way to think of how distributions would be developed. And knowing what we know now, this seems like a strange way of giving up. Um, <clears throat> so real progress came early in early nineties. Again, this is not you know, I, I periodically I've done literature, sort of uh, searches to sort of educate myself on the evolution of these ideas. Um, it's not clear to me why people haven't really understood what I'm going to say next much earlier. I've asked, well, okay, I'll tell you everything I know. Rather than hypothesize what I should make it. And the radical statement here, and again, this came from problems people who were there at the time um, actually paying attention. The radical statement here was that the universe, the universe has well, a wave function. In fact, let me just uh, do this has eigenstates. Okay. And if you have an if the universe has an eigenstate, it has, it has a Hamiltonian. In other words, I'm sure I'm over, oversimplifying some aspects of this, but uh, the idea is that if you can consider an eigenstate of, a, of the universe, then you can consider reduced density matrices um, that people use quite a bit to consider sort of the su systems and subsystems. So there's a subsystem A, and there is the complement A bar, which is the rest of the universe. And the idea is to consider, consider a reduced density matrix, a stationary reduced density matrix of um, this eigenstate, and stationary because eigenstate is stationary. And it's obtained by tracing out degrees of freedom outside of A. Um, starting from a Density matrix of a pure state. Okay. The idea is that if you do that, these eigen so the physics of this, roughly speaking, is the, these eigen the eigenstates are actually extremely complicated objects. They encode them. They, they encode in them. Uh, uh, all the time dependence that you can, in the classical language, you would imagine going on where the main by system fluctuates where particles come in and go out with the right frequency to sample this distribution. The eigenstates actually sample, the eigenstates actually encode all of that. And so if you look at the reduced density matrix of a single eigenstate, right, it'll have the right uh, 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 
normal distribution where the beta is essentially its, its inverse kbt. Uh, it's mentioned right, so it's d, say ds by d of the numbers. Yeah. It's mentioned right, yes, okay. So, I, I was told by Marcus Striegel and by some and various other people who actually you know, know the history of this topic that simply declaring that the universe has eigenstates got these people in trouble to the point where, well, Trudini was established and did not uh, uh, need, you know, need breakthroughs. But, well, well, George was fairly junior and he was told to stop working. A bit more of a fundamental type science where you know you sort of don't make progress, you just find it. I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, but roughly speaking, who was, you know, all of this looks like run of the mill, you know, farm mechanics to me. And so it was it's always a challenge to understand why was this so earth shattering? And apparently it's going back to this that was so uh, old before. Anyway. So, for each eigenstate, so the idea is that what's the idea? If, if I look at the density of states of uh, a main body system, it has some kind of a shape which I obtain by looking at eigenstates and I see a reaction. Right? So, the idea is that entropy is a function of energy, it has a certain shape. And that I obtain by looking at the density of states and getting more of that. So, my temperature is defined by, okay, which, which State do you give me, you give me that state, I'm going to compute the slope of the entropy. Now the question is, uh, you know, there's much more, so this is called eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. But there's much, much more to this hypothesis than just a single state. You know, as important, if not even more important. And so this was tested by the way, say that this was tested, you know. It, this proposal was taken to heart for the first time, as far as I know. So this was done in the early 90s. It was taken to heart for the first time by Marcus Friedel and collaborators. Um, and even there, the history is funny, because they were interested in integrable models, and they spent a lot of time diagonalizing those. And then a couple of years later, they met with Mark Schoenig, who told them, well, actually, in non-integrable models, you know, this is, we never tested that. So a couple of years later, they went and they did it. But the idea of actually taking eigenstates and testing what the density matrix looks like, and whether if you look at the probability distribution of observables here, right, whether it actually is thermal with respect to the global eigenstates, um, I think it was first sort of pursued by the full sort of a, uh, this program was first pursued by Mark Street. But th there's actually an interesting uh, um, sort of question of how typical are these results? This was also sort of started by Marcus collaborators, but one could ask this question. Right? So, let me take two adjacent eigenstates, or some nearby eigenstates. But surely, whatever I get cannot be that different, otherwise this is nonsense. Right? And so the statement is, and this has been tested more recently, is that if you think of the, especially for smaller systems, Small subsystems, you can test this test numerically. <laughs> this should converge exponentially in system sizes. This is only been tested in one dimension. It actually converges extremely rapidly. But this, you know, this, this is the density matrix. This is the, the complete information about the subsystem. So you can measure anything you want. This is the number. I think this is actually the, the convergence of the scaling function is uh, interesting in the sense that if, uh, obviously if you Look at larger and larger and larger and larger subsystems, ultimately these are different eigenstates. Right? But the idea is that the order of the only order of limits we're allowed to discuss is where you take the universe size to infinity all the size of the subsystem. So you can see that they so at some point uh, during the first lecture I sort of declared that you shouldn't put the bath in and you should somehow have the system act as its own feedback. So this is sort of an example of how have an eigenstate of the entire system, you don't have to you know, think of a key path as something you put in. Anyway. 
Well, it's exponentially to. Right. <laughs> I, that's what I want. You know, I think it's there's interesting interesting physics into how this how rapid this convergence is, um, in the sense that, as I said, you know, if I take uh, my subsystem to be a fraction of the universe, I can get interesting results which are not zero. Right? But but the idea is that there should be a separation. So you're generating, you know, an environment with this one or two bit. So I I can never remember the sign for some reason. I, I remember what, which was yeah, I always set my advice to one, but uh, Well I know, but if you start to keep the message halfway through, which I've done also, you get uh, in deep trouble. But I mean I have written mathematical code where uh, I would screw things up at some point and have to do it. And I, what I've seen is that more serious people, they just nail it down in their minds. <laughs> Very good. So let, let me just define entropy. Yeah. The idea is that, so we all know what a density of states is. Right? So, just, so density of states is a single, just any kind of a Hamilton problem. Density of states is um, um, we will introduce an energy variable by taking the inverse of the Hamiltonian, so there's a delta function everywhere we have our level. Right? And the idea is that we just want to sum of all the levels, so my row of E will look like a force of delta functions. And you might ask why, why are they all different types? Well, because I imagine that the density of, I'm trying to mimic the fact that the, the for this force is less dense in some places than others. And so the point is that in the thermodynamic limit, this will become a smooth thing. So what I'm plotting is not the density of state, it's the logarithm of that. And you can sort of convince yourself that once you're out of the single particle problem sort of a domain, all densities of states are exponentially in that case. But this mini body problem, that, that is the definition. In fact, let me be very more explicit. The intensive density of states is S of E. This and that are not important. So up to L of E. So as, as long as you're not near the ground state, the number of states you have is exponential. And if you have lattice problems, all of these are usually Gaussian. When you're at high temperatures, you get that's where you have the peak of density of states, log two plus i. Okay. All right. So the idea is that this just rolls. Um, So I think if you think about what we mean by temperature, it's you know, set by. So if if I give you a lattice with a Hamiltonian and you compute to me the density of states, um, I can talk about mean energy or I can talk about temperature and you know test the thermodynamics with the conversion of that. And uh, so what are the the classes of very good. First of all, let me tell you how, uh, in a way, I'm working things backwards because you know all of this was sort of motivated by cold atom experiments. Um, so the question is, how do you not use eigenstates to discuss this stuff? Because eigenstates are not physical. You, they're they're dummy variables. It's a big calculation. Right? There's a new sandwich. Resolutions of identity <laughs> that have eigenstates in them. Um, but ultimately, to ask somebody to examine a single eigenstate, it's not a problem numerically, but physically that's a big problem. Did I switch to whiteboards? I like whiteboards. I made, a, I made a mistake of drawing on a non movable thing. Anyway, that's an algorithm. It's a I'll use a whiteboard. So now let me talk about, and as I said, I, in a way I'm working backwards in the sense that 
quantum mindset was an experimental, at least first time I heard about it, experimental technique that was uh, popular that sort of uh, focused attention on health. The idea is that, you know, uh, it's easy, easy to, easy for me to say that, um, easy to make simple Hamiltonians say, I don't know, uh, how I spend so some kind of a uh, S plus of two levels to the three plus to the minus, minus plus or many interactions, plus um, field HX sigma X J plus H D sigma Z J. It's all on some lab, say one on a chain. Right? Consider this this kind of Hamiltonian, right? It's it's also easy, also easy to prepare product states. For example, at some time equal zero, I can Expect a good experimentalist to deliver for me a state that looks like so this state has definite information about which way spins are polarized on their individual block spheres at every lattice site, and the way this can be prepared in principle is that you crank up the on-site fields as much as you can get, <clears throat> turn off interactions if you can get them, that, and then introduce some source of external bath. Right? And so what will happen is that the ground state of that Hamiltonian, where the, the on-site fields are humongous, will be something where every side forgets about the neighbors and just polarizes along the world. So this is easy. This is like even a theorist can imagine. <laughs> now, um, okay. Now, so th this is a, a. And now we consider time evolution. Well, I purposely did not write the preparation Hamiltonian. I just described it because it's it's immaterial. I mean, there are different ways of preparation. You know, some people might prepare it by pumping things at some high frequencies. That not important. I think the state is more important than the protocol. The idea is that starting from the state that has no, I would claim, you know, because even though these are block spheres that spin a half degree of freedom, because there is no entanglement that I'll define. To me, entanglement is where you do not know what 100% certainty what each of the degrees of freedom is. Right? And so, by starting with a state which has 100% certainty for each of the degrees of freedom, you can now consider evolving it with this Hamilton. And it's been half degrees of freedom. So does that freedom itself sort of comprise those are the intrinsic? I, I think degrees of freedom is another dummy here. I think counting degrees of freedom is fundamentally uh, uh, undefined, so one has to define. So I'm defining degrees of freedom in terms of the things that show up in the Hamilton. May, may not be the best definition for everything, but if you have a specific question. I mean, I guess I'm always. Ask that question of well, when I take a subsystem in the old days of thermal, that seems to. What kind of subsystem are we taking? Local, in real space. Okay. So I think, no, I, I, these are all very good. So I think the question of which definitions are good physical definitions is a very good question. And I think ultimately the question is um, we have to go. I think that this is the difference between established sort of a condensed matter, sort of a step neck, where good questions have been sort of approved by higher authorities <laughs> that have passed on since then. <laughs> Here, I think people define good questions and then they revise them partly because this seems sensible, right? So if you have a local, have a local in real and space Hamiltonian, 
I mean, and in this case, in the case of quantum clinches, I mean, the motivation is very clear. Either you prepare a big book like this. Unfortunately for me, for that, for them, these kinds of time of funding, the quantum clinches that actually have been studied the most, they come, they originate from non attracting clean problems which have natural degrees of freedom which are plane waves. And you can see that, you know, the definition of the degree of freedom is very much on, depends on what people are actually doing. So in this case, I like this because I can really just go and say, okay, this is a classical bit, this is a classical bit, this is a classical bit. Especially if I follow it from up and down, I can do that now. Go later, use numbers if there's something particular that I wanted to do later. Right? So these are classical bits. There's L bits of information that I just put in there. And the question is, roughly speaking, how much of that information survives? Right? And what StatNet tells you is that, um, except for the total energy, nothing survives. That's what people think. And so one can define for, for you know, the facilitated transitions. I only have the 17 minutes to talk about the localization physics. At this point, I'm going to define something that will be useful to transition to that last part of the uh, lecture. Um, so in this case, this initial state has sigma z j at time equals zero, which is plus minus one. Okay. And so the question is, and again, in my, keeping in mind statistical sort of a way of at least talking about these things, I want to think about correlation functions. So the idea is that we would like to know, we would like to know how much of this initial information is surviving at late times. And in fact, I would like to ideally formulate the correlation function, autocorrelation. So it's basically, literally, local autocorrelation function inside J with itself at later times. Um, better not take chances of this being somehow surviving here versus there. You know, so if you have a chain of sites, L sites, uh, I want to ask, okay, if I go through every site and I measure that correlation function in time for zero time zero, is this, you know, uh, order L to the zero or something? Or, order L to zero. So it's defined in an intensive fashion. So what I'll do here would be that on average every side has some entry right? um, So if the answer is zero, then this is thermalization. Right? If the answer is finite, it's not thermalization. Something is remaining. And so I think the interesting experiments that uh, we call most of the that that led to sort of better understanding and development in theory, um, were actually much more um, detailed that they would look at the full count of statistics of these, of these kinds of observables to try to quantify how much of the uh, 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 athermal correlation is occurring. So, um, there's one comment that I wanted to make about the motivation is that. At this level of discussion, uh, thermalization is a cause in its own right. So you're somehow trying to use dynamical structure of eigenstates to connect it to equilibrium, sort of a equilibrium property um, after the dust settled. Um, so this naively, the question, right, so the right question to ask is how, right, so the idea here is then connect with that, I, I realize that I'm missing a lot. The idea is that if you look at the reduced density matrix computed with respect to the time of old state, you can expand it in eigenstates. So this is a truism if you believe in undergraduate quantum mechanics. It's a question that the undergraduate quantum mechanics has never been tested anybody just in, in a lot of detail, in the same kind of detail that people have tested have. I, I, I can, I, 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 I
Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Good. No, I have a specific question. But... Right. So that's um, sorry. That's the right. So what the, the idea is that now let's trace it with respect to degrees of freedom uh, outside of the subsystem, and what you find is that if you go to late times, or if your time average is density, you know, as if you integrate at one time or one over t, the only thing that survives are the, reduce, uh, are the contributions from individual eigenstates. Uh, the, it's, it's the so-called diagonal ensemble. As t goes to infinity, and the, re the reason is that you know the, all the off-diagonal terms are off zero. So if you find a way to uh, uh, average over those oscillations, either by the way the experiment was done or was just integrated at one time, works, you will find this result, which is a diagonal ensemble. This operation is defined in diagonal ensemble. And so what the idea then is that even though you cannot directly infer individual eigenstates uh, with these density matrices, you can infer essentially their moments over the initial sort of a wave, wave packet that you put into the system. So it's not one to one tra tra translational information from eigenstates to this. Um, and because of this, you can actually prepare initial states that can take normalization for some observables, which is not covered. And that's kind of not really the mainstream knowledge of this as of now. Uh, okay, so now, but what I want to do in the remaining few minutes is to use this as a way of defining and discussing the position. Yeah. It's not. Depends on, uh, depends on the model. Good question. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you take that model, in other words, any model that has a finite entropy per site, log 2, that basically means that in, those, in that model, the density of states is diluted to that without explicitly. It's actually roughly. To a good approximation, it's actually uh, essentially a Gaussian with e to the L a simple cushion. Okay? And so this corresponds to infinite temperature. This is a ground state, and this is the anti-ground state. So you know, when you read it in the uh, um, when you read about negative temperature, you you have gone to low entropy on the other side of this curve. And it's not really, you know, once you draw these pictures, negative temperature is not exotic. Right? It's basically, it's another, you know, um, um, medium entropy state. This is a high entropy state. This is the highest entropy state with the infinite temperature. And this is just a medium temperature. Another medium temperature curve. Medium entropy state. Got it? Perfect. Um, I think the question is, I'm not sure. Um, I define temperature that way. Just the uh, So the, the only place that they come in is heat always flows to something, uh, from something hot to something cold. And so if you had somewhere in the universe that the negative temperature and in thermal contact with anything else, all that, all that energy will flow out. No, no, no. Right. Sorry. Heat flows from lower temperature entropy to higher. So, for example, that's okay. That's heat flows that. So, so, you can take a system and prepare it in an eigenstate or some mixture of states here. And then you can introduce an external perturbation to drive the system. 
And as your textbooks that neck tells you, the temperature will go up. If you pump the system, the temperature will go up. And it'll stop heating up when you reach it to the temperature. So there's, in fact, from that you can deduce that the conductivity is one over the temperature. It is in this region. However, you will never uh, see, if you prepare the, uh, uh, if you do it that way, you will never see this side of the problem. If you prepare the system here by simply just saying that at some point you just don't flip over the field. So what used to be a ground unit, if you think in terms of trenches, you can always do whatever you want. So you prepare, uh, you can instantaneously change. And so if you pump this system now, it will pull down. So, so I think entropy is a bit, yeah, that's that consistent. I'm not, not sure if the, the situation with higher temperature. I don't I'm just saying if you maybe put it in contact with, with, with uh, another, another system. One that but what do I compare? Do I compare the temperatures or entropy? It, it, it's what energy. It's what energy content. I mean, energy always, always flows to, to you increase the energy to total entropy. So that's the only principle. Yeah. Right, so it's possible that you take two of these systems and you arrange it. I think, you know, I've got myself into trouble on this, that's why I'm being cagey. <laughs> but I think the only principle that I haven't seen uh, uh, in trouble is that the only one to raise the entropy the higher. And so in that case, just driving the system never gets used to the other. So I don't know if it, I feel like temperature is just the definition of entropy is much more that is counting. Um, okay, anyway, uh, let me just say so. I, I think the old details, that's the problem, but also it's fine. Um, let me just, I, I think since I don't really have a lot, a lot of time, let me just put it up as a phase diagram. I think, right, so I advertise to you that these problems are difficult in the sense that we don't have. Uh, established tools to solve them, one can, uh, one can play the game of defining some model Hamiltonians that may not be difficult in the sense that there are lots of length scales to compute. So for example, in these kinds of Hamiltonians, you can take the model on pointy sides and use exact diagonalization and compute the diffusion constant for energy in this case, and has weak, weaker finite size effects than you might be worried about, so you can extract. So what turns out is that now, if you introduce here, if you introduce randomness in these um, on-site fields, you can imagine that there are two kinds of behaviors as a function of you know, h x h x h z sort of. Uh, Versus, okay. So here that there, there would be normalizing behavior, and here there would be non normalizing Non normalizing behavior. Um, uh, behavior in the sense of say for example this correlation. Um, and as, because these initial states that are not at a particular low temperature or high temperature, they're just states that you happen to make, you know, you might expect as, as associating these states with infinite temperature in the sense that infinite temperature is your average over a whole lot of configurations. So with this in mind, and again, I'm, I'm calling the anti Historical route to this, you can right, you can think that at infinite so what would you would identify at infinite temperatures as a change in the type of dynamical behavior. So sometimes you normalize, sometimes you don't normalize. And fortunately for us, there was actually uh, um, there was a prior theoretical work. By uh, Basco and Al Schuller, um, where they considered taking weakly interacting or non interacting to start with the sort of problems that have this phenomenon of Anderson localization, which also some, 
sudden diffraction that you have heard about, and asking whether by turning on interactions um, and allowing for a finite entropy, again, the, the, the question is, that is, is the main body system one near close to ground, the ground state, or does it have a finite entropy for particles? Right. What they convinced themselves by purely analytical methods is that there is a, uh, um, a critical temperature um, below which Systems of Anderson localization and above which sort of uh, you get sort of a, a kind of you know finite yeah finite so the uh, This, in some sense, this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that these were the sort of prehistoric dark ages of uh, um, sort of at least my thinking about these uh, correlated problems. So the, the idea of looking at infinite temperatures directly um, seemed, well, okay, it wasn't there. Um, but the idea of if somebody draws it, tells you that there is a critical temperature at which something happens. and Interestingly enough, this paper, because it was worked as a, in a conventional main body sense, that it was working up from low temperatures and it was quite laborious, um, uh, right? But then, because once somebody tells you that there's a critical temperature, if you were used to, uh, uh, to drawing phase diagrams, you might ask, well, what does that critical temperature do as you change parameters in the model? And that proved to be a crucial question because then you more or less convince yourself that if you reduce the strength of interactions uh, or if you turn up disorder, this critical temperature has to keep going up. And in these models, there is infinite temperature. Nothing, there's nothing special about infinite temperature in these models. So it's just all finite entries. And so the idea that there is an infinite temperature phase boundary in these lattice models was nucleated out of, you know, essentially asking what the phase diagram of their behavior would be. Interactions. Let's go on the whole show in 2006. <clears throat> that, you know, that's how these sort of the two very different sort of limits of the phase diagram were connected together. Yeah, so, what I, I'm not going to talk about, but you know, we have to discuss afterwards, is that the amazing thing is that you can actually see the signs of this purely dynamical transition through small systems of magnetization, and that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, that what, what the field has been up to for many years, and only now, as I already mentioned, there are alternate methods for accessing these behaviors. Uh, right. Okay. That's, uh, I don't want to say too much time. Okay. Thank you all. I think this is a great fun, fun day. Let's